Hi, Matt. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Can't complain. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. On Substack, this is the Non-Zero Podcast. You are Matthew Iglesias, uh, publisher of the Slow Boring Newsletter. I am. Which just finished up its third year, entering its fourth. Uh, second consecutive revenue growth year. Well, I guess the first yeah. one was too, because it went from zero to something. It's relentless growth. It's relentless growth. Uh, and author of a few books, including One Billion Americans. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Israel Hamas, yeah. uh, Gaza, more broadly, Israel Palestine. We're going to solve um, it here? I think we'll figure, we'll have it figured out by the end. <laughs> we'll I get mean, the deal I already done. do, but I think you'll agree by the end. Okay. I'm ready to go. Uh, by the way, uh, there is, I actually tracked it down. Who knows? Maybe I'll play an excerpt before the end. The day after the Hamas, the election of, in 2006, yeah. that Hamas won, you and I taped oh, a Black Heads TV. That is the precursor okay. of a uh, non-zero podcast, Blogging Heads TV. I, I've got I, remember, it right. I remember Blogging Heads TV. Yes. I and don't want to know what we said in 2006. I may actually play it, Matt. It's no. not, there's nothing embarrassing, nothing embarrassing. You weren't exactly right, but uh, All right. what you didn't say crazy thing. Anyway, so here's the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've done a number of podcasts on this subject. A number okay. have been, uh, well, I, I got a tweet from someone the other day who said, I've gotten a lot out of these, but I noticed they're all with Jewish men. Now that's a slight oversimplification, but it's true there's been a preponderance of Jewish men. Yes. So I I'm here to provide the uh, Jewish... Arab female perspective is that? <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm afraid the parade of Jewish men continues okay. with you. But there was an attempt to interrupt it. I was. Uh, I had scheduled a taping with a Palestinian American this morning, uh, and then I was going to post yours after I posted his. And so we're going to brief. We pause the parade and then resume it with Matt. But uh, he got sick, and so we're we're uh, rescheduling his. So the parade continues. Thank you okay. for participating. Okay. Um. So, we go. Uh, now here's a question. Um, before we get before we solve the problem and talk about the war itself and so on uh, and its causes or whatever, um, this uh, seeming uh, contrast between young Jewish opinion and older Jewish opinion—I mean, American Jewish opinion—yes, on this conflict. Uh, now there is there, there's there's a broader age thing going on. Apparently, Democrat among Democrats in general, uh -huh. uh, younger people are are less pro-Israel and less likely to support Biden's uh, pretty unequivocal support for Israel. It, it seems to that seems to be true with American Jews as well, but it's harder to tell because I'm not aware of any polling on the issue. Clearly, these elite groups, right, like uh, Jewish sure. Voice for Peace. Uh, if not now, they, 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 they uh, you, you seem to see among, among kind of known Jewish American groups, it's the younger ones uh, that are, well, in the short term, more pro ceasefire, uh, less supportive of Biden's policy, um, more inclined to support things Palestinians are saying. Do you have a sense for whether that goes beyond the elite level? I mean, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, one thing that that maybe misses is that I think at the younger level of American Jews, there's also more Republicans, mm. right? I mean, traditionally, Jewish Americans have been very liberal and then have also been pro-Israel, right? And the I mean, and if you go back 30 years, right, skepticism of Israel in Congress and national politics was more in the Republican Party than among Democrats, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now there's been full alignment of everything, right? And just like the more left-wing you are, the more likely you are to be skeptical of Israel. Um, and so a lot of younger people, including Jews, are just more left-wing, right? And mm -hmm. there's more, I think, you know, young Jewish progressives, right, have gotten very, um, I would say, probably anti-Zionist in their mm -hmm. outlook on this, in part because the situation has changed, in part because their worldview is different. Uh, but you also have more people, you know, listening to what Jewish conservatives have been saying for a long time, which is like, hey, like, just just come over here. Like, the water's warm. The Republican Party, just like, 
loves Jews, loves Israel. We've got your back. Um, Mm -hmm. Come on in. So I think the traditional, you know, Chuck Schumer type mainstream Democrat, Jewish practices a little, but isn't orthodox. Um, What what did they used to call it? Uh, Progressive except for Palestine. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that milieu, I think, you know, is is very strong among people older than me and quite a bit weaker among people younger than me. Yeah, I guess a related question is how much of a political problem is it for Biden that, you know, he, he's getting blowback from younger Democrats, certainly including younger Jewish groups. Um, it seems to me like he's in kind of a bad place for him. Well, for this issue to be salient, right, at all, is just disastrous for Democrats, because the public is overwhelmingly pro-Israel, but the Democratic Party is like about 50-50, right? Mm -hmm. So what you want, if you're a Democrat, is the situation Biden had for the first two and a half years of his presidency, where nobody's talking about this and nobody cares. Uh, When people do care, when it's on the headlines, you are either going to have this constant infighting, which is what he's doing right now, or you're going to be, you know, having a lot of people exiting the party and saying, you know, I'm with Republicans now. And, you know, that's that's sort of normal politics, right? When you're when you're president, when you control the agenda, you try to put on the agenda the issues that unite your party and divide the opposition and the other people want to do the opposite. Um, And, you know, uh, unfortunately for uh, Joe Biden, for any American president, you cannot just control what happens in the world. It's very inconvenient for him. Uh, that Hamas did this attack because any response he would possibly make to it, I think, would put him in a worse position than he was in on October 6th. I think it's particularly challenging for him because, you know, um, Netanyahu, I think, likes him fine, unlike with Obama, but, you know, just like loved having Trump in office. And so Mm -hmm. is not in any inclination to do anything that would be helpful Mm -hmm. to him. And uh, Danielle has been around a long time. I mean, he has, uh, I don't want to say he's outlasted all these presidents. We just have a different constitutional system than they do. Um, But, you know, he served concurrently with Bill Clinton, um, as well as with Obama, as well as with Trump. Um, I think he actually didn't overlap with George W. Bush at all. Uh, but, you know, he's been around for for a long time. He understands American politics very, very, very well. And, you know, has done a good job of getting what he wants out of the American political system, which sometimes, as from Biden, is support. And when it was Obama or when it was Clinton, is beating American presidents who try to put pressure on you. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, speaking of BB and uh, the first Bush, little known fact. Actually, I talk about it enough that it's not so little known. <laughs> um, 1988, uh, I had a one-hour conversation on a park bench in Jerusalem, just me and him with BB Netanyahu. Did you, did you know that, Matt? I did not. Me and BB, Marty Peretz. I was about to be acting editor of the New Republic, and he figured it was essential that anyone, even briefly at the helm of the New Republic, have been to Israel. You had to have a sit down. Okay. And have talked to all the people that Marty would want you to talk to in Israel. So I right. like, it, it was, I, I, it was, it was amazing. Um, so, I haven't uh, had the pleasure. Yeah, well, the night is young. Uh, I, I'm sure he speaks highly of you. Um, the, uh, so, I mean, how much, how much, uh, is this a, I mean, you're still of the view that it's too late to dump Biden. Seems to me this is reason to want to dump Biden. You'd rather have a candidate who was not kind of actively mired in this situation, right? Who can just kind of talk out of both sides. You know, go ahead. Maybe. I mean, it's hard to say, right? I mean, because how do you dump Biden, right? I mean, I think if Biden were to say tomorrow, uh, okay, my polling is bad. I'm old. You know, it's too important for the country. Because this is not dump Biden, right? But say Biden Mm -hmm. self-dumps. Right. Yeah. And he says, I'm not running for re-election. Um, well, you know, then you're just you're going to have a divisive Democratic Party primary uh, dominated by Israel stuff. Um, and which I think mm-hmm. someone who's supportive of Biden's line would win ultimately. I mean, I think um, I think the 
Palestine friendly internet. Well, wouldn't it, I don't mean to be challenging yeah, yeah. him on this issue. Oh, no, no, no. I know. It's not I that just, you I, It could no, be no, somebody just, who more or less agrees with him on this issue and, right. and just says, I'm, I'm younger than 107. And I, no, and no, I'd no, like I, to be I think, I think, I think there could be like a lot of benefits. No, I'm, I'm saying that like the divisiveness of this issue yeah. is yet another reason that an open contest for the nomination yeah. would be challenging and, and sort of painful for people. Um, I mean, I think, you know, optimal thing for Democrats probably is for Biden to steady as he goes, run for reelection, and then just like the day before the convention, pull the plug without warning. What? And then Kamala or what? Yeah, I guess. Oh, please. That doesn't help <laughs> our prospects in, in November. She seems great. Next um, year, yeah. But, you know, uh, uh, I thought I thought we were going we yeah, yeah. to fix we're gonna Israel, fix the thing. We're going to fix the thing. So we can either start. So I've got three things I want to cover. Okay. Uh, one is the tweet of yours that got you ratioed, but we can wait. I think that- I'm, that's, I'm always being that's, ratioed. I, wanted, I don't even know which one. Well, this one is, well, I'll give you a hint. Uh, I looked in the replies and somebody got 1.7 thousand likes for calling you a pathetic sack of shit. Nice. That wasn't the whole tweet. There was substance to the tweet, and maybe people were agreeing with that. Just feel On like that's just they like every day, man. Out of tune with this guy if they liked his tweet, right? Okay, sure. But let's save that. Okay, we're saving so, it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, one thing um, now, you and I. So it's two two big things. What to do? Let's talk a little bit. About, I want to get to from the river to the sea. You and I have engaged on Twitter on, on that, and and uh, you know the various meanings of that, what people mean by it, how divisive it seems to be becoming, and so on. But maybe we should talk a little about uh, solving the overall problem first, uh, starting with the question of like, do you think? Um, I mean, my first thought. When I heard about October 7th, after kind of assimilating it all and thinking about the long term was, well, this is bad for the Palestinians. Yeah. Just what, you know, people who don't really want the kind of solution you or I might want would like to see, which is the, the ability to kind of conflate all of Palestinians with a, a, a horrific attack. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and so I thought and just a lot of people naturally go, God, these guys are animals. Why? No wonder you can't you can't deal with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that was my first thought bad for the Palestinians. Yeah. Um, that then I, I kind of wondered like, but is this such an earthquake that when it finally subsides and various people get a little more equilibrium, um, Israelis and other people will be more convinced that, look, we've got to solve this thing one, uh, once and for all, there's mm -hmm. that argument. Like, so before we talk about how one might try to solve the overall problem, um, what's your sense for whether this has increased or lowered the chances of it getting solved? Well, you know, I mean, you said your first thought was this was, this was bad for the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That was also my thought. Um, I thought that what would happen is that Israel was going to pulverize Gaza and mm -hmm. kill an incredibly large number of Palestinians. Um, that is what has happened so far. And I would say that that is bad because I am a person who um, believes in cosmopolitan humane values. And I sincerely agree with the ceasefire protesters when, when, mm -hmm. when people are like they're holding up pictures of like dead babies and like this is some sad shit like we wish this was not happening i like i agree with that so firmly like i think it's it's like really awful when people suffer and die and so when i saw this attack i thought like this is really bad right that being said there is a palestinian national cause Right. And the, the cause takes different sort of aspirational goals, but they all have to do with the, you know, the political objectives of the Palestinian nation. And when there was some uh, Hamas, uh, one, one of their spokespeople abroad, I think in Lebanon or on Lebanese television station, you know, I saw an interview with him where he was like, you know, these people are, are martyrs. There's no national liberation without sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see not in a like whose fault is it really kind of way, but that 
you know, Hamas has a theory about why provoking open war will be on net beneficial to Palestine. And what they mean by that isn't that like the average welfare of the population of Gaza will go up as a result of this. What they mean is that the odds of achieving Palestinian national goals go up. And you see, I think, a a tension between those two ideas running across a lot of different parameters of this um, of this conflict, right? And you know the the concern among Palestinian nationalists, which I think was very plausible, is that the direction they were headed in was that Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. was going to make a deal with Israel that you know cut the Palestinians out that they kept asking Netanyahu like just like give us a fig leaf, like give us some bullshit that we can say we have done for Palestine. And then Yahoo was being reticent to like even give them bullshit. But the other thing, by the way, is the bullshit that seemed like it was going to get done was Biden was going to get Saudi Arabia to divert a lot of resources to the Palestinian Authority, which is Hamas's rival. So there's kind of nothing good about this process from Hamas's point of view, from Iran's point of view. We were going to give Saudi Arabia security guarantees or from the Palestinians point of view, because traditionally recognition of Israel by Arab states was the prize Israel gets for solving the problem. Exactly. So in, in retrospect, I wrote about this in, in my newsletter, but this was just kind of for the Biden administration not to have thought about these consequences. And I kind of think they didn't. I mean, how many powerful players this was antagonizing uh, hmm. would be kind of diplomatic malpractice. But I digress. Well, I, made I, that I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if they thought about it or not. But I mean, I, again, from the viewpoint of Hamas, you know, you can look at them and you could say, oh, these guys are butchers. Like, they're just, like, killing these Jewish civilians for no reason. Uh, but they didn't do it for no reason, right? I mean, they did it because pushing Israel into direct conflict with them would make it politically untenable for the Saudis, they hoped, to go through with normalization. They hope that it will induce Hezbollah and other members of the the axis of resistance to attack Israel. And and they're, you know, they're they're trying to ratchet it up. And so as someone who just thinks it's sad when people suffer and die, this all seems very bad. But if you are a, you know, a, a violent nationalist organization, Increasing the number of people on your side who get killed is a price worth paying for the the cause of the nation, right? And like that's what they are doing yeah, but- here. That this this war has made it less likely that the Palestinians get completely boxed out of regional diplomacy, and it keeps hope alive for something to I, I, happen not 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 for like palestinians as individuals but for palestine yeah, yeah. as a as a nation right and uh, you know i you don't i, I don't want to say like you got to hand it to them because like <laughs> this is i wouldn't uh, say that because, because this even, is terrible uh, but there's a even there's, six weeks after five weeks after the fact i would not but there's say that. there's a there's a a logic to it right and you know what Tom Friedman and all the smart people have been saying is correct that like Israel should have responded to this in a way that was not like literally I'm going to just walk down the path that Hamas paved for us. Well, yeah, I mean, I think first of all, I agree that probably a a big part of the motivation was to derail the normalization process uh, between Israel and Arab states. I I don't personally think they anticipated quite such a massive response. I mean, I've heard two things that I think make make a kind of sense when put together. Uh, I'm sure you've heard at least uh, one of them, which is that maybe they didn't, you know, you've heard the term catastrophic success, right? They didn't sure. realize, I mean, uh, yeah, they planned to kill civilians as well as soldiers, but they didn't realize it was going to be this easy. They didn't realize the troops are going to keep 
their militants or whatever were going to keep uh, marching, you know, uh, so far into Israel and wreaking so much havoc. Before right. you, can, you, you at least you, you couldn't assume that that would work. No. And uh, so I've heard that. And, and the other thing I've heard is like, believe it or not, they thought that these hostages would induce some degree of moderation in Israel. Right. And and I think that in a way is not crazy when you recall that Israel, that Bibi himself, I think, once traded that's, that's uh, a thousand to one thousand swap. Yeah, Palestinian yeah, yeah. prisoners for one Israeli soldier. Well, you know, I so, mean, this is I mean, part of what makes this stuff so challenging, right, is it's very hard for people to know how to interpret, you know, other groups reactions to these things right mm -hmm. so i mean the the day this happened i was talking to somebody who knows israeli politics much better than i do and he was telling me it's like there's going to have to be a massive overwhelming ground invasion of gaza even though we're getting even the palestinian casualties like casualties to the idf will be high that because of what netanyahu did before with the thousand to one swap he now mm. can't afford to do anything less than a full bore attack and mm. i when he explained that to me i was like okay i hear what you're saying uh but then when you explain it the other way that hamas's interpretation of that prisoner swap was these hostages will be really valuable mm -hmm. like th like those both make perfect sense um it's <laughs> Just it turns out that like one of them was correct and one of them yeah. wasn't. I mean, and, and I mean, of course, like this is the there are so many disastrous things about this. But like this is the problem when you have two groups of people in intense proximity, but with no real communication or understanding of what's going on, of what the significance of different things are. Uh, there was this poll I saw at Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research that came out over the summer, you know, and it seemed to, is done, you know, as a Palestinian uh, polling operation. And, and, you know, they seem to indicate that Palestinians interpreted the protest movement in Israel uh, about the judiciary as indicating like fundamental instability in Israeli society, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would could have told you that I mean, this was very divisive, but that it was an indication of the extent to which um, the peace camp in Israel had like completely collapsed and gone away. Right. That like that wasn't even the divisive issue in Israeli society. Right. That it was like there was the there's the people who were strongly motivated to just like stick it to the Palestinians, and there's the people who don't care. But that you know that they they were reading this 180 degrees backwards. Um, and yeah, I mean. So, yeah, I mean, I personally don't think uh, uh, Hamas imagined the Israeli army getting as far as they've already gotten uh, in response to this. Um, but whatever. I mean, we'll see what happens so far. You know, the, the Israeli army seems to be having a pretty easy time of it in terms of uh, at least what superficially seems to be gains on the ground. Who knows? Maybe Hamas is uh, is holding back these uh, anti tank weapons that are much better than the uh, RPGs they've been using, which are pretty ineffectual. Maybe a bunch of them will pop out of these tunnels all of a sudden and do something. But uh, right now, uh, you know, it doesn't. Uh, the, the the degree of resistance a lot of people have predicted uh, has not materialized. So right. anyway, you you think it's you think it's 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 possible that at least more attention will be focused on the issue of a long term solution in the wake of this than would otherwise have been the case. Of course, other things have changed as a result, including the attitudes of Israelis, and that factors in. Uh, could You could argue that either way, I guess. So, but that's your position, right? That that in a way, there there will be a new round of at least wow. seeming to wrestle with the problem? That I'm not so sure about. I mean, there's going to be a... You know, there's been a stepped up... I mean, again, right... It, there was a huge march in Washington, D.C. and in other major world cities mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of the Palestinian cause, right? Full of people waving Palestinian flags and um, shouting various slogans that people then argue about the meanings of them. But they're clearly intended as like pro-Palestinian slogans. And the fact is, on October 6th, 2023, nobody was doing that. 
Right. Right. That's different from like, is the international community going to have a serious effort at political solution? But it is just true that the war has generated, um, at least superficially, a popular mobilization in the West on behalf of the Palestinians that was not existing. I mean, if if we had recorded a podcast on October 6, 2023, mm-hmm. about the situation in Israel-Palestine, what we would be saying is that um, Israel had pulled the plug on any good faith effort at peace talks uh, a long time ago, that Netanyahu had the most right-wing government in Israel's history, and that a very slow motion, you know, low-key ethnic cleansing of the West Bank was locked into place. And also we would have said, and nobody cares, Mm -hmm. right? That there's zero interest in this uh, in Western politics, that there's this small number of House Democrats, the squad, who are like, nominally committed to pro-Palestine, but they weren't saying or doing anything about this as of fall 2023. The Saudis were ready to sell the Palestinians out, um, were just like begging Netanyahu to give them a tiny amount of cover. And, you know, now because of the war, this kind of passive pro-Palestinian minority of Americans are active, they're fired up, they're saying things, they're doing things. Um, I don't know what good that actually does, Mm. Palestinians. I mean, I I feel like there's like almost no people on the planet who have ever been blessed or cursed with as much um, like cheap talk on their behalf as Palestinians. I mean, you know, as, as the Israel people will tell you it's like people don't get out in the streets and march like this over other kinds of humanitarian issues around the world. Um, on the other hand, it's like nobody's actually doing anything for Palestinians. Like, like, like nothing's been accomplished for them for fifteen years at least. Um, yeah, well, and you know, in a way, I think it only got to be a big issue on American college campuses a few years ago. That that momentum did start to build before this. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, money was put into, you know, and, and work into campus organizing going back to yeah. sometime in Obama's presidency, right? That's when you started getting like campus BDS advocacy yeah. groups going. Um, and that's when, you know, people, I, I've seen some people saying that like the tools of cancel culture are like now being turned against, uh, left-wing pro-Palestinian groups. Well, wait. They, but I think historically they, that's backwards. Yeah, they started it. These yes. people, the Barry Weisses of the world invented cancel culture, which yeah, no, they, I agree. you know, they pretend to rail against in this general universal way, mm-hmm. but are the original practitioners of. I've, I've written this piece a couple right. of times. So it's now just come back around full circle to where it started, I think. Yeah. Uh, which is that, you know. Um, and if people don't quite get what we're saying, we're saying that, you know, harsh criticism of Israel or even just kind of mild-mannered, reasonable criticism of Israel was de- labeled anti-Semitic in an attempt to stifle it, in effect. There's a whole speech police kind of infrastructure uh, that have enforced this code when Jimmy Carter wrote his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, which, just, which was just a warning about the situation becoming more apartheid-like. He had to apologize lest he be... Uh, Stigmatizes anti. If you if you if you go back and read the uh, the infamous uh, Harper's Magazine letter of 2020, um, you know one thing that you will see on it is uh, Bari and some other people like her, but also a lot of people who had been um, deeply involved in sort Canceling. of Palestinian organizing. Oh, uh, no, oh, no, okay. no. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah. like it was there was a, 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 a kind of like conjunction of, of huh. minds there. Right. But, you know, so like Zed Jelani, who I used to work with years ago, right. you know, he like started uh, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine chapter and was but hasn't you know, he taken a turn ideologically. Is he still I, lefty on I, this issue? I don't know. Um, I think now he, now he I mean, you witnessed <laughs> were, were you at the Center for American Progress when 
you know, APAC and ADL said to them, nice think tank, it would, it would be a shame if something bad happened to it, which will happen if you don't change the tone of what uh, your blog is saying about Iran? No, that happened after I left. Okay. When I, I was but, there. But he was there and was one of the prominent. Uh, well, that's uh, how he came in. He was in. one of the villains, the designated villains by the pro-Israel speech police. Well, when I was there, right, um, they quietly built up, you know, a group that was quite, you know, Fashikir, Matt Duss, Lee Fong, and, and Zed. Eli um, Clifton was there, I think. And, Eli uh, Clifton, yeah. So they built up a very sort of critical, um, Israel critical group of people around in progress. Um, and then after John Podesta left, I think the institutional support for that went away. But it wasn't, it wasn't just that. This The Intercept wrote this up. There was an intervention by the pro-Israel uh, speech police. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, no, no, no. I mean, yes, they yes, like, yes. They no, like no, no, sat no, no. down with Nira Tandon, the president of, right. of CAP, and said, you got two ways you can go on this lady. Keep no, but what, but, but what, but what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that that pushback yeah. is not the first time that there okay. was pushback from those people. It's that at the time that I, I was there, when Podesta, Podesta was, was running to, CAP, okay, okay. he was protecting god bless that man i didn't realize i had a high opinion of him but i do that operation um i'm probably telling tales out of school but um that's interesting so okay so uh now this is not unrelated i mean let's go ahead and do your ratio tweet because it's not unrelated i i think i understand why you got all the blowback and and i want to uh, i always do you, you tell us what you actually meant by the tweet and then we will get on to solving the actual israel palestine yeah. problem um it says, the tweet is, the thing about Rashida, is it, do you know how she pronounces it? Tlaib? I don't know. I say Tlaib, but that's probably Tlaib. not good at uh, Arabic or whatever. Is uh, The thing about Rashida Tlaib is she's Palestinian. It makes perfect sense for her to be mad at Israel and fired up about it. What's sus is all the people who aren't Palestinian and seem to care 1,000 times more about this than any other humanitarian issue. Now, the main piece of innu innuendo I associate with statements like that is, are you guys closet anti-Semites? Why are you so obsessed with this issue? Yeah, Which is what I don't the speech think... police say. What did, you, what did you mean by it? Well, I mean, I meant by it, honestly, that like when I hear Rashida Tlaib making what I think are over-the-top comments about this, um, I think like, of course. Like, of course. Right. But That's what's how so she strange feels. about other people being intensely interested to the point of obsession about it? I mean, people have different reasons. I can give you a reason. I pay a lot of attention to it, aside from the fact that Marty Parrott sent me there at an impressionable age and we have path dependency at work. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's like it's like my tax dollars are going to kill the, the yeah, civilians in but Gaza. See, I, that, that's that's and, what I don't buy, though. Because, and listen, I think this yeah. could become World War Three. Uh -huh. And I have long been annoyed, to put it mildly, by the amount of influence the pro-Israel lobby exerts on American foreign policy. And on I mean, there's a lot of, uh, which, by the way, if you say that the wrong way, the speech police come at you because you've invoked an anti-Semitic trope. I didn't say it the wrong way, you'll know. There you go. You just I didn't, said say, it great. I didn't say it's all about the Benjamins. You're lovely. I would never say it's all about the Benjamins. <laughs> um, no, but that, that's what I mean, you know, because here's the thing. I believe and have long believed that the United States should stop sending money to Israel. Um, I don't think that it is constructive foreign policy. I don't think it's good use of foreign aid dollars. Um, and that's like a, you know, would be a contentious view if I went up to Capitol Hill and I said that. And I've said it on Twitter and I've said it on my blog and I said it in an interview with then President Barack Obama. Um, and the fact is, is that it's still in the in the discourse, right? Like that doesn't make the left wing people happy with my takes and my tweets because it's just not really about the aid money, right? Like it, it just isn't. You know, the support like, we give they, them goes well beyond that. Well, but no, but it's not just that the support we give them goes well beyond that. It's that the the passions that this topic stirs are not questions about the optimal allocation of the American foreign aid. Budget. Um, Correct. 
And that's not yeah. what I meant by the influence on American foreign policy. I meant, right. for example, them impeding a constructive relationship between the U.S. and Iran, for example, mm -hmm. and encouraging uh, hostility, if not actual war, between the U.S. and Iran. That's the kind of thing I mean. Um, but... Uh, yeah. So, so wait. So, so continue. The left would like you to say what that but you're I, not but saying. I, but, I, but I don't really want to insinuate anything against you because you run a full spectrum, you know, like peacenik operation here, right? I mean, you want appeasement with Iran, with China, I, I, with Russia. There will be peace in our time. As I'm fond of saying, and it is like completely. Like, that's exactly what you would expect, right? Like, it would be really mm -hmm. weird if you had Bob Wright's takes on uh, America's relations with Russia and China. And then you were like, yeah, but we got to bomb Iran, right? Like, that right. would be crazy, right? Well, uh, but there's a lot of people, you know, who do not have any kind of consistent engagement with American foreign policy um, or with just, like, the world in general. Right, who get like mm. very indignant all of a sudden about just kind of like normal shit, you know? Like I've seen people going on these like weird Twitter tirades about about like a Jewish ethno state, and it's like, yeah, but that's like all states are like that. Not all states actually, but many, many states around the world. Um, but honestly, I mean, I didn't mean to insinuate anything against anybody. I meant to defend Tlaib. Okay. Like I think, I think that a lot of pro-Israel people, you know, practice a lack of. Uh, We're choosing our generosity. words very carefully here. No, a pra practice a lack of generosity in their interpretation of what other people are saying. Oh or well, doing. sure. Oh yeah. There's an element of cynicism from I think you know the ADL and the American Jewish Committee and APAC and some of these other organizations. Um, but there's an aspect that I that I recognize from across other issues of, you know, mainstream American Jews feeling very authentically, sort of like psychologically affronted by things that other people say and do about Israel. Like it, it hurts their feelings. And, you know, I don't think, I mean, I was ratioed many times and canceled many times uh, during the great uh, awakening uh, of 2020. And I feel the same about this. I think that there's a real problem of people in our current society, like uh, marinating in their psychological vulnerability and their feelings and their subjectivity and mm. weaponizing it. I mean, I felt really thrown off my game on October 7th, I will say, as a as a Jewish person who doesn't think of himself as particularly pro-Israel or, or Zionist. I was really shocked and, and alarmed. And, and and what I tried to do, and I don't know if I succeeded, but what I tried to do was gain some emotional and intellectual equilibrium. You know, because like that's not the best way to think about issues from your like maximum point of subjective vulnerability. And I think so much of what people have been doing since that time, starting on the Jewish side in the United States, but I think now expanding to um, lots of Arab Americans um, and it, it is like abstracting away from the combat and the conflict and the deaths and the political issues that are in place into this idea that like, it's a symbolic attack on me to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing that, you know, I need Congressman so-and-so to take some like ineffectual piece of position taking. And, you know, I, I get why people do it. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm broad-minded. I've been around, I've talked to a lot of people. I, I, I see why people feel this way and why they do these things, but it's not, um, it's not good. It's not healthy. It's not reasonable. You so know, they're personalizing. Uh, they're personalizing the issue and making it about their identity. You mean? Yeah. You know, and, like say what you will about America's policy toward Israel, right? Um, there are people 
who like suffer materially from this Israeli counterattack in Gaza. You've noticed that, yes. That's a very real thing. It is like not the case that this is like a cosmic spectral assault on like American Muslims. Well, right? yeah, now, but, but you, would you feel... say the same thing? Uh, you are, and you're and, saying the same thing about the other side that yes, there is anti-Semitism. There's probably been an uptick, but. Is that you're saying the same thing about both right. sides? I, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, to an extent, if, yeah, I mean, that mm. like American Jews, I understand because I felt it, too. So I understand where people are like, holy shit, mm. you know, there. But for I the mean, grace did of you God, feel it personally, like, you mean online, you got people said things about you. That, that were anti no, no, like I felt it person. No, I just, uh, just I saw just what was reacted. unfolding. I, I and see. I was like, oh, my God, like it's it's a pogrom. It's all happening again. But it was like, OK, right. but is it? Like, is that true? Right. Does this right. actually have anything to do with well, me? And, the, and it doesn't, you know what I mean? And there's a, there's a cynical power in today's day and age in saying, you know, I saw an uh, MIT student on uh, Jake Tapper's show, and she was talking about how she didn't feel safe on campus because of... Yeah. So these purchases, and I, obviously, you know, this is a teenager. She may very well not feel safe, but like, I would like her to know... <laughs> that she is safe on the MIT campus. Like she does not in fact need like the MIT administrators to make a rule against saying mean things about Israel for her to live in safety in the world. This is not even a, you know, an individualized yeah. judgment about her or MIT, but like that's life, right? And, and again, all the things that like center right people have been saying about the left and these things like safetyism and all this stuff like this just also applies to the pro-israel discourses that it's like uh, i've got a piece coming out tomorrow about um some of this uh about, about like what we know analytically about anti-semitism in america yeah. um and you know I think a lot of people who have joined uh, protest marches or posted memes on uh, social media have said things about Israel that are very ignorant. Um, and I think the reason that they've done that is that they're just ignorant. Like most Americans have almost no information about any foreign countries, mm -hmm. right? And so like the fact that they don't know what they're talking about when they discuss the long range history of the Israel Palestine conflict is that a personal attack on American Jews? That's mm -hmm. just like the right. baseline level of understanding that everybody has. And so, among older Americans who also don't know anything about this, the conventional wisdom is very pro Israel. And so, they will say totally ignorant things that, uh, you know, like erase Palestinian national narratives. And among mm -hmm. younger people, especially uh, educated people, the conventional wisdom is much more favorable to Palestinians. So they will say ignorant things in the opposite direction. But like, we just can understand sociologically, this is like most people, most of the time on most topics are just passing on second or third hand misunderstandings about stuff that has nothing to do with them, right? It doesn't impact their lives personally. It's a lot of cheap talk and, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's good. Like, I try to write on my website, like, informative articles <laughs> that explain things to people. This is a conflict that has a lot of history to it, probably more history than any group of 11 million people on the planet uh, deserve on some level. You could spend your whole life reading books about, like, what was and wasn't in the mandatory Palestine white paper of 1939 and, you know, mm -hmm. who said what when and who banned land purchases. But it's like, you could just admit that you don't, mm. you don't know or care. Well, uh, one reason that I actually thought, I thought occasionally, briefly, that this whole thing might make a solution more Likely is that there are a lot of people who didn't know anything before October 7th who actually are getting a little educated on the on on the subject, and that might do hmm. some good. But um, you know, the 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 thing you just said about um about anti-Semitism and 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 so on reminds me of something I actually just did uh, Glenn Lowry show. It hasn't appeared yet. I said mm -hmm. something that uh, I think I said something that may get me into trouble, but I want to ask you if you agree. I mean, it's not that controversial. So basically, obviously, the memory of the Holocaust is a big thing in Jewish uh, psychology, not for all Jews. But yeah. uh, and, and actually, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask you, 
does do you think it figures prominently in your own psychology? I mean, you weren't brought up with a I gather you I mean, I don't know what. I think I heard you once say you didn't go on your birthright trip or something. That's certainly a warning sign. But yeah. um but uh was the Holocaust do you like when you said your reaction to October 7th was, oh my God, uh, was that related to how much you've heard about the Holocaust uh, and the history of Jews? Because I think in Israel, it was a factor. And I guess what I said on Glenn's show was, I think that may play a role in motivating the reaction, which I think in the long run is going to be bad for Israel in terms of the magnitude of the Gaza assault. Um, and uh, so what? what uh, explain this to me. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I don't want to just like yada yada past the Holocaust, but I would say, you know, more broadly, right? My family, my my Jewish ancestors, um, were not Holocaust survivors, but they left Eastern Europe, as many people did, uh, during you know, the episodes of pogroms, right, mm -hmm. would occur in the Pale of Settlement and people would leave, right, in various kinds of waves. And the, the first few waves of Jewish immigration to Israel were also sort of big impulses from waves of pogroms that happened in, in Tsarist Europe. And then there was also the Holocaust, uh, which both killed a lot of people and then also displaced a lot of people permanently who went various places. Then after the creation of the state of Israel, there was a lot of violence, uh, you know, in Muslim majority countries, which led to most of the Jewish population of those countries leaving. And, you know, that I think is the kind of long tail history of the global Jewish community that is very salient to people who are Jewish, right? That the Zionist proposition was that, you know, you can have these moments of safety and security in various countries, but that the world will never accept Jews mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a wandering nation apart, right? That we live in a, in a world of nationalism and of nation states, and that, you know, if Jews are going to exist as a people, they need to have right. a state. Jews who live in America, like by definition, um, are, are not they, that they committed did. to the Zionist project, right? Like we we haven't gone up and, and moved to Israel. We're living in obviously a country, um, but, you know, a country that more so than most tries not to define itself in those right. kind of blood and soil national terms. Um, I feel but, that when yeah. Israel was founded, America was not being receptive to Jewish immigrants and, and kind of nobody was at the at the time. Well, the exactly. Zionism kind right. Of culminated in but, the, in but I mean, but I mean, if you look at the history of American immigration policy, right, the, you know, immigration reform that happened in uh, 1965, the, the Hart Seller Act was very heavily influenced by Jewish American activism and lobbying, even though by the time of the mid 60s, right? I mean, by the time uh, Emanuel Seller was able to get that bill passed, um, it led to very little Jewish immigration to the United States. But he'd been working on this issue since the 30s, right? And, you know, uh, guys like, um, like Steve Saylor, you know, the uh, racist and uh, anti-immigration, uh, you know, internet character, um, he he really doesn't like Jewish American liberals and our constant agitation for openness to immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and when I saw like Trump, right, I always thought, you know, this this is bad for the Jews, man. Like, even though right. I don't think Trump, like, bears Jewish people any animosity at all, he's just, he's participating in a global nationalist discourse that right. is, like, objectively contrary to the interests of the diaspora. Uh, so I think that there is, among people who have any kind of Jewish political identity, you know, a cognizance of these waves of violence and persecution and expulsion, 
right, as events that have occurred and recurred throughout history and at moments in time when people felt, oh, like we're really assimilated, we're really secure here, and then things take a turn later. And, it, you know, I mean, it's a history that lasts thousands of years, right? So there are very long times of, you know, the Jewish community of Salonika prospering under Ottoman rule and and seen as, you know, you know, it's it's an Islamic country, but with a lot of toleration. And so we're mm -hmm. here in America. We're doing great. Um, I think the United States is a is a lovely uh, country and and one that that I'm proud to live in. But you know, you worry when you see these things mm -hmm. happen because this is the this is this is the story. Yeah, and I I've always thought that if you know one reason attitudes seem to be different among younger Jews is that they just feel less directly connected to the Holocaust. I mean, they they haven't, you know, they haven't, they're less likely to have talked to relatives who witnessed it or talked to sure. relatives who lost siblings. Yes, I mean, less likely, but, but I mean, less likely to have talked to, I mean, also less likely to have talked to people who fled Europe before that, right? I mean, they're just right, right, the whole thing. I think so, the biggest, but so, I mean, I honestly think the biggest difference, though, is not that, is, um, uh, the changes in Israeli politics. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, I mean, a harder I can, country to I, like. Yeah. I, I can talk about like events that occurred while I was an adult who paid attention, right? At at Camp David and Taba, and I can talk about you know Ehud Olmert and coming around and you know trying to do some negotiations, and I can talk about moments when I think. Palestinian Authority blew some opportunities, moments when it seemed like Israeli electoral politics was was on a knife's edge and something much better might happen. But if you're under 30, right, like all that's ever happened in Israel is that you've had, you know, these Netanyahu governments who like are not uh, attempting any kind of political settlement of the issue. And so you either need to become someone who is on board with that, or you need to become somebody who's very critical of Israel, right? Whereas, you know, mm -hmm. you go back, I remember when, when I was a, a kid, you know, in, in the 90s and Netanyahu's first term, and I was in Greenwich Village and in a reform synagogue and, you know, a very liberal progressive rabbi. And, you know, he would just say very openly, like, I think, like Netanyahu is bad, and I hope he he just won one election, right? Mm -hmm. And the hope is like I hope he will lose the next election, and then the next government will go back to pursuing a diplomatic two state solution, mm -hmm. and he did lose the next election, right? And then you know there's a lot you could say about what happened under Ahud Barak's administration, but at least from a ten thousand mile view, like Netanyahu was defeated. And then right. the new labor government did engage in diplomatic talks with the Palestinian Authority. So you could just be on that side. And if you're in your 50s, you could just sort of robotically keep saying the same things that you would have said in 2005 or in 1997. And whatever, it's like, just like, that's what I say. But if you're 29, that's like never made sense. You're mm -hmm. like, you know, who's doing what? And And I think... I am not optimistic uh, that there's going to be any kind of productive resolution of this. And, you know, I think we're going to look back on, um, I forget if it was 2009, I think, uh, Israeli election, um, when Netanyahu defeated uh, Tzipi Livni. And, you know, I think that was a real hinge point that, you know, you had Obama putting, I think, meaningful pressure on the Israeli government and certainly making his views known to people. And you had people like me, you had, you know, we were talking about the blogging group at Center for American Progress. And, you know, everybody, we were all saying, like, guys, like, you may not be able to get a deal done in the short term because diplomacy is challenging, but you need to freeze the progress of the settlement project right, so right. that you are holding the door open. Right. To right. a diplomatic settlement, which might happen soon or it might happen a long time from now. But you have to put the facts on the right. ground on pause so that you can have those talks whenever they happen. And I think everyone was like super clear about the stakes there. 
You know, I think mm-hmm. like Livni made that case in a much more clear and robust way than Barack um, ever had. And Obama made that case in a much clearer way than mm-hmm. Biden ever has. And it's like the, the voters did not agree with that. You know, this- and in the the subsequent timeline, they have made it clear that they don't agree right. with that. And to younger people, like that's the reality, which doesn't mean that they all become uh, students for justice in Palestine, but it means they either go that way or they align themselves with the actually existing Israeli policy rather than, you know, I, I think right. I think if American Jews controlled the Israeli government, when George W. Bush was president, we would have had a two-state solution. But um, like we 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 did. Yeah. <laughs> um, Israeli Jews controlled it. So this brings us to our solution to the problem. Um, okay, so I, I guess neither of us is very optimistic, but in theory, uh, you know, the question of what kind of solution is the more plausible or the less implausible. Yeah, of the two, the two main options being one state and two state. You recently weighed in uh, pro two state uh, on Twitter. I mean, but you've just now outlined one of the reasons two state is so unlikely. The the, the growth of settlements has continued mm-hmm. relentlessly. You know, in the standard two two state plan, Israel keeps the big settlements closest to the borders does land swaps with, with the Palestinians to compensate for that. Right, you but can't do that to, now. But, well, right, because there's so many settlements further away that... You, you would, to, to, to do a two-state solution now, You, I, I mean, you could still do some annexations and land swaps, but right. at this point, to have a viable two-state solution, you would need to do a meaningful amount of forced displacement of uh, Israeli uh, citizens. Right, of from, evacuation. From, from, from the West Bank. Um, I and there's now how and there's now like over two hundred thousand of those. Yeah, I mean it's hundreds, it's hundreds of thousands of people, uh, which is like, again, like, I mean you can you can check the tape on this, but like I spent a lot of time saying that they should not do this uh, because they not, have, not expand settle not not right. build more settlements. Yeah, um, yeah. I still think that it is more plausible that you get the Israeli government to do large-scale settlement evacuations than that you get the Israeli government to disband the Jewish state as such. Um, That being said, I'm also not that invested in like me saying which would be preferable. The main thing I would say about this is that I could tell you, and anybody could tell you, like what it would take to have a two-state solution. You know, which is to say something like the old maps from Annapolis or Camp David, Mm -hmm. which at this point in time would entail large scale settlement evacuations, but it's logistically tractable versus one state solution. I just don't think that the people who are excitedly for that have done much of the the spade work, you know, like where I read the PDF that like explains how that works. Mm. Um, I think it's telling, you know, the the Arab League and the OIC, you know, just put out their uh, organization of the Islamic Conference, their like resolutions on the war. And, you know, they're calling for arms embargo on Israel and all various things. Um, What they advocate for in that uh, memorandum is a two-state solution. Which again, it's not to say like we need to do what the Arab League and the Organization of the Islamic Conference has to say, uh, but if you want to reboot this issue around the idea of binationalism, which a lot of um, people seem to want to do, I think there's a lot of political groundwork that they have not laid. I think that this Mm. like, Carping about the slogans is to some extent like a distraction from well, it's not it's not the unrelated. actual question. It's it's not unrelated. I mean, I think there's two reasons uh, Israelis and some American Jews don't like the slogan from the river to the sea. 
there are the people who really think that everyone's using it wants uh, genocide or wants to to drive the Jews out of Israel or something, uh, or even to you know eliminate the Jewish state per se. Whereas there are the people who understand that a lot of people chanting it at these demonstrations are just saying, give Palestinians full rights, let them vote and so on. But if you play that out, it leads to the end of Zionism. If Zionism is seen, uh, it, it probably does. If Zionism is seen as, as you know, formal preferences for Jews as they now enjoy in immigration and some property but rights. No, but I, 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 don't, I don't think that's the issue, though, right? Like, I, I think they're your... Um lighting an important question, right? Which is, so you could imagine, or we can postulate a world in which, you know, the Jewish state as such is dismantled, that there's equal rights for everybody, there's right. no special law of return, and there's right. a secular binational democracy that happens to be approximately 50% Jewish in its inhabitants. Right. And everybody gets along well. And there's like Hebrew Arabic uh, diglossia, or there's parallel school systems, or whatever it is. But everyone's just chugging along. And so, in some sense, right, like in the formal terms, like Zionism would be dead, right, under those uh, uh, postulates. But the people who we now know of as the Israeli people are like they're doing fine. Right, right. The, there's been a loss of the theoretical right of diaspora Jews with no family ties to Israel to just like apparate in the Tel Aviv. Um, but everybody's doing well. I think the concern that most people have, regardless of what the subjective meaning in the heads of the people saying free Palestine from the river to the sea, mm -hmm. right, is that the reality of what would occur. Right. If tomorrow Netanyahu was like, oh, shit, you know, I've been reading some good uh, Instagram memes and I realized right. that settler colonialism is wrong. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop the bombing and we are going to hold an election in which everyone currently resident within the boundaries of former mandate Palestine can vote on equal terms for the Knesset. And like what would actually occur if he said that? would be civil war and state collapse. You think that's the fear, that it would immediately happen? I mean, I certainly agree. That, 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 that there is no proposal on the table for like, a struggle. like how, so for example, Hamas is a heavily armed Islamist militia. Yeah. That, like, is not committed to a secular democracy in which everybody lives in peace. Now, it's fine for a secular binational state to contain an Islamist political party, just as it would contain, like, mm -hmm. you know, these various the Zionist Jewish, political Jewish, party. But yeah. just these various Jewish religious parties that are part of the Isra Israeli landscape. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't have, like, an armed militia as, like, a state within a state you would need some process to disarm them you would need some process for reorganizing the idf you would need to do something about extremist settler yeah. groups right like it would be a very 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 challenging problem i think quite a bit more challenging than forcibly evacuating yeah. far-flung settlements which itself is a hard problem right but we don't have if everybody was looking at the history of lebanon Right. And the story of Lebanon was this is just like gone amazing. Right. We've got Muslims, we've got Christians, we've got Jews, not Jews, Druze, want to say it correctly. Um, you know, no majority. Everyone's just like living their best lives in peace and security, democracy, freedom. You'd be saying, like, why can't we do that in Israel? Right. But that's not the history of Lebanon. It's not the history of Syria. Um, it's not even really the history of Egypt, whose well, yeah, Christian you know, population. I mean, keeps... they, they, all these countries have their own stories, and there, and you can point to to uh, I, you know, Lebanon got invaded by Israel. Syria was subject to a proxy regime change op operation by the U.S. and allies, and so on. I mean, if you're talking about fairly recent history, mm -hmm. uh, but but let me be clear: the um, you are you you're saying there are two questions. What do you think Israelis 
fear about a one state solution, even if they understand that it begins by people just saying one person, one vote, including Palestinians. What is it they fear happening? Uh, there's that question. Then there's the question is, what do you think would happen? I think you just said you think there's. Yeah, a I mean, I'm just, I'm just talking about just I'm, happen, happening. I'm just talking about what I think. Right. You know, now, I mean, because there's two different groups of people. Well, there's yeah. many groups of people. But like one question is like, what's in the heads of Americans who go march on the National Mall? Uh -huh. Another question is like, what's in the heads of uh, people who live in Palestine, right? Like these are sort of different things. Just as I think that if American Jews ran the Israeli government, we would have had a settlement freeze and a two-state solution long ago. I think that if like all of Palestinian politics was organized by Western leftists, like they would have a really compelling campaign for secular binational democracy, right? But like it's not. You know, like I've talked to Palestinian activists in the West Bank. Like, what do they say? We'd start a civil war if they gave us the vote? No, no. But they say, you know, we're going to get our land and our homes back. Well, right. Now, that's a slightly separate issue. But I mean, that's certainly one of the fears is that in terms of what Israelis fear, right. I think I think the fears, uh, what they fear about even if they understand what is meant by from the river to the sea by kind of leftists in America. So what is the fear about that? If it really just means one person would vote. I think uh, there are some pretty vague fears that amount to, well, they will run us out of the land one way or the other. In other words, less specific than the fear you just outlined. But I do think one specific fear is right of return, untrammeled right of return. They'll show up with the keys uh, to the houses that they're, uh, parents inhabited and say, well, it looks like a new home, but we still get this land, even if the key doesn't work anymore. And and uh, I, I think that's a specific fear. And, and, and it's hooked up to a vaguer fear of getting run off the land. Now, I mean, I would say I'd say a couple of things in reply. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to say. One, it doesn't so much speak to the Civil War fear, which I, I guess resides largely in fear of like what Hamas would do in a way, we could address that. I do think that if, if you had a, a democracy with about 50% of the vote Palestinian and about 50% uh, Israeli Jews, um, you would start off with the Israeli Jews having way more wealth and entrenched power. And you know how democracy works. It wouldn't be like they lost control of the situation overnight, assuming things continue to work through legal formal channels, right? Through the channels of governance. Now, I know you have a separate fear, but that's one thing I would say about the fear that, oh, the Palestinians immediately control the government and, and push us out. I mean, democracy is more complicated than that, right? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. But, but, so here's, here's what I have to say about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I could just like, right? Somebody can say to me, Matt, two-state solution, what are you talking about? These settlements are everywhere. And then I could be like, yeah, but like, you could just make people leave. Like, this is doable. The flip side, one state, Bob, like, what are you talking about? This is going to be chaos. It's going to be disaster, civil war. And you're like, no, like, you know, we can work it out. Like, we can, right? Like, there are mm -hmm. constitutional structures and there are confidence-building measures and there are disarmament. Like, there's ways to do things. Mm -hmm. What I think, as someone who is trying to be like more agnostic about these things, is that I can find fairly detailed two-state solution documentation, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Like people who have done the legwork, people who have advocated for it, like major international players who are committed to it, concepts, things like that. I don't see. And I, I, I like, I may just have missed it, but I really have been looking for like, where is the political work on the Palestinian side? You, you that, mean the that, planning or the, or the, you mean a, a picture of what it would be like or, or, a, or a transitional plan? A little of both. Yeah. 
you know, like, like, what are we doing here, right? So, I mean, one, you know, people raise the South Africa analogy all the time. Um, and, you know, as with all analogies, it's imperfect, but I think it's a reasonable-ish one to raise. Um, if you look at ANC political documents going back to the 50s, they are talking, like, very clearly about equal voting rights and equal citizenship rights for yeah. everyone. There's no, now people would say, right, like uh, so defenders of the apartheid regime would say all the time, like Mandela is just lying. Like this is a plot for a communist takeover. Right. But it wasn't just that like some third parties on a podcast would be like, no, I think you're wrong about that. Like they had an official political program. Yeah, there there isn't, as far as I know, like an organized Palestinian political movement with a recognized leader and spokesperson that has a like authoritative. Here is our one state campaign document that yeah. says what it is we are asking for. There is the desiccated and discredited PLO with the two state solution. And there's Hamas and Islamic Jihad, right. with whatever it is they're on about. And then there are campus organizers in the United States who are like saying this, that, and the other thing. But you, a, a, a viable one-state movement, which yeah. certainly could exist, but like it needs some corporeal reality. It needs some symbolism. Mm -hmm. It needs some programmatic documents. I mean, people do, you know, they, they do these Nakba Day marches with their keys, mm -hmm. right? Now, if an Israeli guy says to me, Matt, I live in terror of these Palestinian kids with their symbolic keys, I'm going to be like, I don't know, man, like maybe chill out a little bit. Most people just kind of practice the symbolic rituals that they picked up from their parents. Surely we as Jewish people who are like repeating ancient prayers and things like that, like we can all get that. At the same time, like it's politics, right? And like the symbolism matters. These are deliberate. I think part of what appeals about um, From the River to the Sea as a slogan, part of what appeals about the key as a symbol is precisely that it carries some ambiguity. But, you know, you need to, a, like a political movement needs to clarify its goals. And I think like, I think a lot of classic Bob Wright stuff about the importance of cognitive empathy Mm -hmm. would serve, you know, Palestinian activists. It would, it would serve the whole world well, yeah. Well, I mean, it would serve everybody well. But I mean, like, specifically on this, I think I think well, if they read you, they'll get a lot of uh, criticisms well, I mean, of Israel yeah, that they already I, agree with. I mean, look, but I, it, it but would I think serve Israelis well. I mean, they would, they would make a better uh, two-state offer. It would serve everyone well. I agree. But I don't, I don't think that's the only obstacle. Uh, I, I mean, when I was no, in the No, I mean, Bank, a very large... <laughs> obstacle is that the Israeli government doesn't want uh, no, that, there's peace. All that. Like they want to kick all the Palestinians okay, out. Okay, but, but, here, like, but, but this is my, what, what, one thing I would say in response to that is if Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, and let's just focus on the West Bank uh, for right. now, um, started just doing these demonstrations saying, just peaceful demonstrations saying, all we want is the vote. You are the mm -hmm. government that rules us. You say you're a democracy. Mm -hmm. The Jews who live 500 yards from us get to vote. All we want is the vote. Mm -hmm. That would be a very powerful force in international politics. Now, the Palestinians right. will tell you, if you start doing something reasonable like that, the Israeli government will do all it can to shut it down. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll jail and kill whoever it has to jail or kill. That's what they say. But there's another, there's another obstacle, which is that... Now, I haven't been to the West Bank in... Uh, 12 years or so. Mm -hmm. But um, back then, what some people would say about demanding the vote was wanting to vote in uh, asking to vote is normalizing the occupation because you're accepting the legitimacy of the Zionist government. Now, I would add right. this was back at a time when after the Israeli withdrawal, Israel had kind of succeeded. I think this was a big part of the goal of the withdrawal from Gaza was to kind of separate Gaza from the demographic equation and mm -hmm. make it so that it was, it was just like West Bank Palestinians that Israel is thought of as being responsible for. And then for one thing, if worse comes to worse and there is a vote, you still got a majority Jewish vote and so on. 
And so when I was talking to these West Bank Palestinians, the, the I, I think when you thought about them being given the vote, you were kind of thinking about them being given a vote that would not lead them to like a 50-50 split, but they would still be a minority in in uh, in Israeli democracy. But for whatever reason, that reaction, which I don't know how active it still is, that is uh, that is something of an obstacle as well. There are a lot of obstacles. And look, I, I'd be happy with the two-state solution. If, if I thought you could actually withdraw all those settlers, fine. Um, but I just saw a documentary about the withdrawal of settlers from Gaza in, in 2005, and that was only 10,000 of them. And believe me, that was like pulling teeth, to put it uh, mildly. Well, of course. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, well, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's long been a sort of mixed feelings about the Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship of to what extent should they participate um, in the Israeli political process? Well, they are ambivalent. But to, and, and, about one you know, state, and, sure. and, 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 and more recently have been more inclined to engage and participate. And that was decisive in the last sort of non-Netanyahu government that happened in Israel. There's also this very anomalous situation in East Jerusalem where, you know, because Israel formally annexed East Jerusalem, which they haven't with the West Bank. So there are these Palestinians who live there who have these like residency cards and they theoretically have the right to vote in the municipal elections, but not in the national elections. And they mostly don't uh, because they don't want to legitimize um, the process, which I mean, that that's uh, that's not what I would do. Um. But, yeah, they, I mean, they are under occupation, in effect, in, in, even in East Jerusalem. Um, right. You know, but I think, I mean, I also just don't, you know, if you read most of what I see of Palestinian opinion suggests to me that, you know, just as the, the reason the conflict exists is that the publics on both sides do not want the things that would lead to a resolution. You know, I mean, I was really struck. Um, uh, you know, P Peter Beinart wrote this great piece uh, in the spring about how he thought the Netanyahu government would be likely to undertake, you know, a... a a second Nakba, right? Mm -hmm. uh, given sort of cover of war and, and the configuration of Israeli politics. And ever since this outbreak of fighting, you know, that has played very heavily in the discourse among foreigners about what's going on, right? That, yeah. that you know, Netanyahu is attempting mass displacement. Because it seems to be going the on population to, of, to of, some extent on the West Bank as well as in Gaza. I mean, you, and, and, you, right. And so these strike me as completely reasonable concerns to have, that the Palestinians are very weak and are, you know, very vulnerable to displacement. Again, uh, Palestinian Center, uh, sorry, um, Palestinian Center for, for Policy and Survey Research, they did a survey on the 75th anniversary of the Nakba and mm. said most Palestinians did not fear a second Nakba. Uh, most Palestinians favored the resumption of armed struggle against Israel. And most Palestinians believed that Israel would not celebrate 150th anniversary. Um, not to be that, like- That was more, West Bank and Gaza, West Bank West, and Gaza. Both West Bank and Gaza and combined. And like, not to be a like moralist about this at all. Like, I, I just like, I don't think that that's accurate. You know, like, I, I don't think that Palestinian armed struggle against the IDF is going to produce the liberation of Palestine from the no. river to the sea. I think it's going to produce the, you know, the ethnic cleansing well, of the ethnic yeah. cleansing of, of Palestinians, no. right? Uh, uh, but it, that's just like their understanding of the situation does not align mm -hmm. with the understanding that I think sympathetic observers abroad right. have of what's going on, and that's you know that's a factor yeah. in all of this, and it has been, or sorry, I rather it was during the Oslo process, right? I mean, I think. Probably if we could go all the way back in time to Bill Clinton, 
that he was too eager to get that handshake done without having Except a, for a vague path instead of a well-defined path that, that that you know that the party that that arafat and rabin were in fact further apart than mm -hmm. one would have thought at the moment right. that came out and that you know of course it's good to have peace talks but you don't you don't want to go forward to the world and say like here's our glorious peace process unless you're like actually quite close mm -hmm. to a deal and again south africa right there's this period that they call talks about talks when like Mandela's still in prison, but like heads of the South African spy agencies are coming to visit him there. Mm -hmm. Because before you do the big kumbaya moment, you wanna make sure that people understand what they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, that was clearly not, not the case during the Oslo years. And Palestinians feel that this scam was run on them. Right. And Israelis feel that the Palestinians were not serious about making a deal. And some of that is just the normal kind of bullshit and people blaming the other side. But I think a big part of it is that the two sides sincerely um, had a different view of like what a final status solution was going to look well like. i'm not sure it even got that far i mean the, the the concrete complaint of the palestinians which is undeniably true is that israel kept building settlements while they were moving toward what was supposedly going to be a, a, a negotiation for a two-state solution so how seriously you know did they mean it now i i would say a couple i would say one thing about the uh polling there are certain circumstances in which polling results well, I think there's doubt, there can be doubt about either their accuracy or their uh, kind of uh, permanence. I would, I would say Ukraine is a good example. Uh, you know, polls show overwhelming, uh, traditionally in Ukraine, an overwhelming refusal to settle for anything other than total victory. I think that's about to change even in the polls. But I would say the polls, even as taken, probably reflected to some extent a it's sense expressive. of what a patriotic it's expressive rather right, than right, analytic right. yes so i would not say that the poll results like that represent a long-term um obstacle i would say that the, the other thing you said which is that look armed resistance by the palestinians uh, ultimately leads uh, to catastrophe for the palestinians that's why i said uh October 7th, my initial reaction was, this is bad for the Palestinians. I mean, first of all, for the reasons I specified. Right. Uh, but, but secondly, you know, even if you entertain the scenario you laid out by which it may all be unfolding according to the plans of Hamas, well, those plans are disastrous for Palestinians because ultimately, obviously, you know, Israel plus the U.S. and Israel's various supporters beats uh, a bunch of Palestinians who don't have very good weapons, right? And, right. Uh, and, and so, uh, but I mean, I, you know, this is to, to, same as the polls. I never know how seriously to take this, but I, I was interested, you know, when I was in the, the West Bank, um, you know, because I would say things to be like, I, I, like, I don't know, guys, it's Israel's got nuclear weapons, you know, it seems like a, a powerful state. Um, you know, people will talk about, the Crusades, you know, and how like those Christian kingdoms lasted two to 300 years, but mm -hmm. ultimately Saladin got them. And, you know, that's the kind of thing where, you know, I, I write it down in my notebook and I'm like, okay, if I want to do a piece that's like about how I met um, all these lunatics, like I could write that piece. I didn't really want to because people just say things sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. especially when they're kind of on their backs um and don't feel like they have really good options but it's hard to it's hard to know you know i think it's hard to assess what level of realism there is i mean you check the ukrainian example right because i mean you've written this a million times and i Obviously, some of the Ukrainians who were saying, like, we're holding out for total victory, reconquest of Crimea and stuff, like, knew on some level that that didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But if they all knew that, like, they would have said to the Russians, 
hey, we've got this big stockpile of weapons to use for a spring offensive. But how about before we launch that, you know, sure. we try to have talks. And like that, that's not what they did, right? I mean, some of them believed that they were going to hold out for total victory. Um, and there's, there's no way to make sense of those events unless that's true. And you just don't. Yeah, but the, in that particular case, one theory recently floated by somebody who knows more about this than my po uh, uh, on my podcast knows more about this than I do was uh, you got to understand, uh, you know, Zelensky probably had the the, the chance uh, via the Minsk Accords to prevent this whole thing, and the, and 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 there are people in Ukraine who believe that, and so if he winds up settling for an end of the war that's clearly much less favorable than what he could have had via Minsk, he's got a lot of explaining to do. That, that's, I mean, this is yeah, a different but, matter. But, I mean, but, well, that, that, that is a different thing. But I mean, I think a similar type of issue, you know, recurs in the Palestinian side, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to end up making an agreement that is worse right. than what Arafat could have had 25 years ago, right? Like, it wasn't that great what he was offered, I think, but go ahead. I, I think I mean, what, whatever it is. That's you know what I mean? It's just, it's just that, I mean, this, this is the non zero podcast, right? right? So it's like we can, there, there's a world in which you're looking at maps and you're saying, well, the what Arafat could have had was not that great. Mm -hmm. So naturally, you have to have more. But the fact is, is that something worse than that would still be better than what Palestinians have now. Right. But it would be hum politically humiliating. That, that to, is, to accept something like well, that. Well, of course, Arafat's not around to be humiliated. And he's, no, well, he's, but, but I mean, but, but, yeah, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just these, these dynamics are very complex. And like, I can't yeah. read people's minds. You yeah. probably can, because um, I can, yes. Because of, yes. of your, your cognitive Buddhist, empathy, my super your Buddhist power. work. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, um, I don't think anybody in Palestine cares what I think at this point in time, uh, which is fine. But I hope that somebody who they do care about or people who are over there are giving some thought to how they can create political momentum that, you know, is militant in some respect mm -hmm. while also seeming reassuring. I think that a lot of what goes on, I, I think that a lot of pro-Palestinian uh, advocacy in the United States projects unrealistic, like conveys bad information to people in Palestine about the strength you mean about of their- how much practical support they have or- Yeah, and about their prospects for success, you know, that like, we oh, are right. so far from the United States of America, like muscling Israel well, that into making concessions that are wildly unacceptable to the Israeli electorate, right? We're quite far from even like small pressure. Uh, mm. and I think I think it's important for Palestinians to know that. You know, to, well, to know think, that, like, I don't think that, they have any illusions uh, about about America coming down, the American government coming in to save them. They're 100 percent cynical, as they should be. I mean, I, I, I was going to say earlier when you said, well, uh, Palestinians are now in the awkward situation of having to accept a deal that's worse than the one Arafat could I'm not have saying had. Have to. I'm just saying. No. A Palestinian but, leader. But what who I want to say is, yeah. it is the job. If the United States were a true friend of Israel, it would mm -hmm. be the job of the United States to step in and like explain things like this to Israel. Like, here's the political equation on the other side. Okay, this sure. is what you got to deal with. It is in your long term interest to to offer like, hey. Two to one land swap, you know something. Something they weren't offered last yeah, but time. Here's, here's here's why I always disagree with you about this stuff, though. I think you feel like Israel's only source of information about what American elite analysts think about things is these like official statements that come from the White House. I think that everybody in Israel understands that, like. 
all the smart people in the United States of America think that Israel should make a much more generous two-state solution offer. And well, that not they have, all the smart people, because some of the smart people are the people applying pressure on our government so that it won't apply no, no, pressure no, 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 to but, Israel. But, but, yes, yes, we but know then, some of these no, smart no, no, people. No, 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 I know, I know. But I mean, I'm... I, I, I'm saying smart people, meaning people who agree with meaning you, you but, and me. But but what, yeah. but what I'm saying is that like I think the Israelis have heard these arguments loud and clear. I think they understand them perfectly well, and that they reject them. That they believe accurately that they have American politics sewn up. I hundred percent right? agree with you. I hundred percent right. agree with you. They right. don't give and a so shit I, what we you and I think because they no, no, know. But, but it's but it's not just they don't care what you and I think. I think that like. Joe Biden. By the way, by come, the way, that was an anti-Semitic yeah. trope, Matt. But go ahead. I know. Yeah. I think Joe Biden could come on this podcast and be like, "You're right about everything, Bob." And I don't think that that would change. I, I think this was the experiment we ran during the Obama presidency, right? Which was like, what if the president of the United States got meaningfully more pro-Palestinian than the balance of power in Congress? Yeah. And the answer is, it doesn't accomplish anything. Not much. I mean, look, he made it you know pretty I mean? far. He made it pretty far. He got the Iran deal through, not nothing. But then ultimately, the kind of hardcore pro-Israel forces wanted to disrupt that. They found their opportunity. They did. Right. But I mean, but also there, I mean, to to honestly, like, not be anti-Semitic and conspiratorial about it, too. Like, this was not a, like, low salience. You know, sometimes, like, lobby groups, whether they're ethnic lobbies or, you know, business lobbies, whatever, like, do weird shit under cover of darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, like, this was not that, right? Like, no. congressional, the Speaker of the House of Representatives when you invite invited the Prime Minister conference. of Israel, right? Like, th 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 you know, <laughs> this was not, like, the special no, interest no, sabotage the bottom behind his back. Like, what they did was they publicly, politically humiliated the president right. of the United States. And like Joe Biden, I think correctly, is like not going to let that happen to him. And the issue is that not just like APAC or Congress or the Biden administration, but like the American public has, I would say, not only strong pro-Israel views, but like strongly anti-Palestinian views. Well, and, and then my concern a, after October 7th was that that would deepen and harden. Yeah. You know, and so one thing I was looking at was um, uh, Itan Hirsch's research about um, uh, anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States. You know, when he finds that anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States are mostly clustered on the right, mm -hmm. uh, not on the left. Yeah, um, I, I retweeted that tweet of yours. So one thing he also shows is that it, it's like in there in the paper, but like those same people have strongly anti-Muslim views, uh, stronger. Than Wait, which, which, which same people have the- uh, yeah, People on the far right of American politics. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so- Yeah, I know, it's not to generalize about a general bigotry on any part of the spectrum, but, and it, and it isn't, it probably isn't general bigotry per se. It probably has specific reasons for uh, uh, for both things. I don't know. Well, but. all these things, but I mean, it's, you know, American, you know, an interesting fact about uh, dynamics in the Holy Land is that um, Palestinian Christians, or, or Ar Arabic speaking Christians yeah. are very much Palestinian, you know, in their right. national identity. Right. Um, American Christians, though, see yes. Israeli Jews as their oh, friends. Yeah. They feel that Israel uh, makes Jerusalem a convenient place for them to go visit as tourists mm -hmm. and aligns with God's will on earth. And that a Palestinian Holy Land would not, you know? And that's like, that's a big problem for Palestinian advocacy uh, over and above issues with American Jewish organizations, anything you or I or anyone who might possibly be on this podcast would think. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't have like great ideas about, you know, what you would do about that. I remember long a time ago hearing Bob Novak um, and some other number of like weird dissident Republicans talking to a small room at the uh, 2004 Republican National Convention about, like, the plight of Arab Christians um, in Palestine, but also in 
Egypt and other places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, why can't I get anyone to care about this? Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not Christian or Arab uh, or any of these things. Uh, but like that is an angle that has had no juice at all. Um, and, you know, there's just these like daunting political obstacles to the Palestinians if their theory of action is that they're going to pressure Israel directly. That's really hard. They're going to mm -hmm. pressure Israel indirectly through the United States. That's really hard. It seems like the Arab states mm -hmm. who traditionally advocated for them are looking uh, as hard as they can for a pretext to ditch them and ditch this cause. So they've got Iran and, you know, the axis of resistance. And I don't know where that's going to get them. Yeah, the um so yeah, I don't know. I mean no, I mean I I'm I'm not optimistic uh uh about things. I would I guess in a certain sense things look no bleaker than they did before October 7th because at least attention's being focused on the problem. And look, we don't know how this is going to play out. There may yes. be a regional conflagration involving the US. After con conflagrations, people sometimes do stop and take stock. But, uh, you know, that's not something I'm hoping for. Um, I think one thing you and I agree on is if we agree that actually solving the problem would be in Israel's interest, then we are agreeing uh, that the pro-Israel lobby, loosely speaking, has been bad for Israel, right? Because they, they've impeded the kind of American leverage that would have made a solution more likely. You don't look like you're going to agree, but I think I've got you in a logical trap. I think everything you've said leads yeah, yeah, yeah. up to this conclusion. I mean, look, there is obviously a sense in which that is true. And that's why okay. I was like proud also, to be okay. at the first J Street conference. And like, that was our whole pitch, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, people do get to define their own interests. Uh, I think that Israelis, um, you know, some Israelis have misperceptions about the security situation or like the nature of Palestine or other kinds of things. Uh, like a lot of Israelis have a romantic, uh, religious attachment to the biblical land of Israel. And it would not be in their interests to give up on that. Um, well, no, you but know, if it I, keeps leading to situations where the whole world is calling Israel evil and, not, and the whole world isn't right now, but this is the, this, the current phase of the war is, is some bad public relations for Israel. Now, I think in Israel, tell me if I'm right about this, there is this view that hatred of Israel and or anti-Semitism are almost like universal constants. They're not going to change. They're always going to hate you. You might as well do what you have to do to defend yourself. Do you think that's a huge exaggeration? I mean, I don't think that that's accurate. I think no, that it's that not accurate. It's the no, no, no. way they yes, think. Yes, yes. No, I mean, it, I mean it's this... a caricature of the way they think, but there is some yes, of that, I mean, right? that's what I think the most dangerous, the, 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 the real sense in which I think pro-Israel advocacy in the United States has done a disservice to Israel is that adopting the anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism line is a good way to hack American campus politics Right, because like the way American colleges and universities are administered is insane. And so if you can convince people that something is like objectively racist or anti-Semitic, you can like make people stop talking. Um, and so do you therefore have a strong incentive to make that claim? Putting the meme out there in the world that criticism of Israel is a constant force that is wholly explicable by uh, anti-Jewish sentiment leads you to believe that it doesn't matter what you do. Right. And that's not true. And the presence of genuine anti-Semitism actually doesn't um, even change that calculus. I mean, the thing that, the number one theme that like I'm hitting all the time on my subsect about all topics, right, is that like, it always matters what you do. Mm. Right, like there is always a person on the margin, on other sides of things. Um, those can even be people who don't like Jews. You know, um, like it doesn't. It's not outside the like hot house environment of cancel culture. It just like it doesn't pay 
to posit that your adversaries are unthinking and incapable of reacting to your mm -hmm. own decisions and ideas. Um, and, you know, Americans have done a lot to reinforce that when, you know, Israelis on some level have to know that that's not actually true. Like there's a, they normalized relations with Egypt and with Jordan. And then later with the UAE, with Bahrain, uh, mm -hmm. they got close to normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia. Obviously the opinions of Arab people um, vary according to what goes on. And in that case, right, I mean, in the case of the UAA normalization, it's not even that, like, Israel did anything to make the Emirati government mm -hmm. like them better, but Iran did things that made the UAE government like them less, mm -hmm. right? And, and that changed their attitudes. And it's the same thing. I mean, what I would want most of all would be to take Netanyahu, MBS, Sisi, like, they need to work out amongst themselves something that is viable and not have... And includes the, the interests of the Palestinian. I mean... You mean a I solution would, to I, the Palestine problem? I mean, I think it would have to include yeah, yeah. a solution to the Palestine problem, well, right? I do think that, October that the, 7 the, the, made the, that the, a little more likely, right? That the, that the, the Saudis right. will, have to, will have to... But the, the American role in this relationship has been to paper over the profound disagreement between Israel and the anti-Iranian Arab states, right? And to like sure. bail them out of their own failure to reach an accommodation with each other. Right. And I think that that is very destructive. Yeah. You know, that the, the best odds for resolution right, are that the Arab states would genuinely like to align with Israel. And they genuinely cannot do that as long as Israel is executing a slow motion ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian population. And Israel would benefit a lot from having friendly relationships with the other countries that are in that region. Mm -hmm. And so they should there are a lot of different political formulas that could make everybody better off, but yeah. you would have to coordinate on one of them. And having the United States around as a like, well, even if we can't get our shit together, or even worse than that, right? It's like, if we totally blunder, probably the United States will intervene and bail us out. Like, that's really bad, you know? Um, and like... I well, yeah, really it worries worry me at, the, at this moment about these American troops in eastern Syria and western Iraq. Um, they keep getting hit with rockets that yeah. then keep not killing them. So then yeah, Biden, it's weird. It's like the number that's been wounded with zero fatalities is getting bizarre. But right. So then, so then Biden fires back and it's tit for tat. And you're like, okay, this is okay. But it's like, if three of them, if three American soldiers die, then can Biden keep this on such a low boil? Right. Where, you no, know, it's, he, it's, he hasn't addressed the public about this, right? It's instead been just like press releases from Lloyd Austin's desk that are like, oh, it's bad that three of our people got a concussion. And so we fired back some rockets, right? But it's incredibly dangerous and really bad for the United States with, I think, ambiguous outcomes for Iran, Israel, everybody else. But like, really not good for the United States mm -hmm. of America. Like, we do not want to fight a war with Iran whose cause is that an Iran-aligned militia somewhere in Iraq shot a rocket at a small American military base in right. Syria that's there for no reason. Like, that's not... That's, like, really, really, really bad. And I, Justin Logan did a great piece in, uh, in Reason about this, but I think it's been, like, the subject of way too little focus in all this. It's not as, like, emotionally engaging mm -hmm. as, like, what are my feelings about pro-Palestinian slogans? But is this, like, an actual American policy choice? Like, um, Trump, like, kept ordering the military to take these troops home, and they just didn't do it because he's, like, at it being president. Mm -hmm. And then Biden came in and as far as I know, has never like addressed this topic. 
Well, at the same time, like Trump, in a public also, way? Trump also set in motion the Arab-Israel normalization process that, as you say, or as you imply, you know, is an impediment to getting this problem solved. Because what needs to happen is the Arab states do need to sit down and 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 at least be conscious of the fact that it's in their interest to seem to have the interests of the Palestinians at heart and uh, and actually solve the problem. That would be nice. Uh, Trump made that less likely. And then Biden, uh, to his, I think, everlasting shame, just wanted to finish the Palestinians. I mean, he didn't want to do that, but that's the effect of normalizing with Saudi Arabia, which he was hell bent on doing, partly for reasons of, you know, Cold War competitiveness with China or something. But uh, I don't know. I, it's uh, I'm not impressed with uh, the Biden foreign policy. But the main thing is that we promised to solve the problem and we have. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I won't uh, I won't actually play, I guess, any of that. 2006 conversation between the two of us uh, about in the, a day after the Hamas election. But if I did, it would probably sound something like this. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, you want, if you're Israel, to be able to negotiate w with a government that actually has the capacity to shut down the violence if they want to. Um, although that seems to me to assume that Israel genuinely wants to negotiate with somebody. Um, what, what I'm hearing a lot of from sort of uh, American Israel fans, I mean, you see a, a couple posts on the corner saying this, you see an article on the New Republic's website, seems to more take the view that this will provide Israel with the international cover they need for refusing to deal with the Palestinian Authority and just continuing with pure unilateralism uh, this time. Utter yeah. So yeah. that that, uh, that makes that's, sense. That's the, basically what happened. Well, actually, it was a little more complicated than that. I mean, I think uh, because the U.S., I'm going to write about this in this uh, Friday's non-zero newsletter, I think, but um, it was the last stab in 2008. Yeah, there was. But I mean, on the issue of Hamas, what you were saying is they will not engage Hamas, which was correct. But you were kind of saying it's really in Israel, given that they don't want to negotiate, it's in their interest to like have this government uh, Hamas running Gaza and saying, well, that's why we can't negotiate. These crazy people right. are running. But the Bush administration insisted on actually deposing them, which kind of happened. And I'm going to I'm going to write about uh, all that. Uh, but um Bush was uh, not a great president, you think? in my opinion. Um, so, Messed up a lot of stuff. So anyway, uh, thank you for doing this. So so your uh, your newsletter, by the way, oh, let me do a quick commercial. Uh, usually, you know, I've been, well, this is advice for you because you're about to start doing podcasts on your newsletter, right? Trying. So I can be your guide. I've been doing this. Uh, are you going to follow the standard formula where part of it is public and then there's a paywall that descends and they're on the edge of their seats? I think so. Well, I have magnanimously been refraining from doing that in these dialogues that are about the Gaza crisis. And uh, but instead of doing it, instead of bringing down the paywall, I say this thing I'm about to say, which is because I'm so magnanimous and such a good guy, you should at a minimum sub subscribe to my non-zero newsletter possibly do what what would will get you past the paywall in future podcasts, which is become a paid subscriber to the Nazir newsletter, uh, and maybe rate and review and smash the like button. Now, you don't have to do this kind of promotion because your newsletter is uh, succeeding on such a spectacular financial scale, right? Slow, boring? It's, it's well, but you always need more. You're kind of you know? you're kind of the SBF of uh, Substack. Would you say I, that just I, so much money you lose track? Oh, <laughs> is that eight billion? But you mean that eight billion isn't on the exchange? It's in Alameda. Oh shit! I, I love account. that analogy. You know, uh, you uh, you're a personal friend of SBS, right? You've had drinks, non-alcoholic drinks, to be clear. <laughs> that doesn't help. He was he was not a <laughs> that, that would not be the source of the stigma, Matt. <laughs> it wouldn't be what you drank. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, All right. Um, I should uh, I should probably like be a responsible parent and stuff. Go go do some uh, actually constructive work. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. All well, right. thanks. It's Matt. been a pleasure. See you down the road.